following here are some highlights gleaned from Dr. Lydia McGrew, and I'll be including a playlist from her channel that you'll want to check out in its entirety, defending the birth narratives you can find in the description. McGrew points out that if these were made-up accounts, they're not at all something that would appeal to a Gentile or Jewish audience. Let's think about a Jewish audience for just a moment. In his book, Who is Jesus? scholar N.T. Wright points out that the virgin birth story would have triggered a Jewish audience because the Almighty caused an unwed teenage girl to get pregnant. And even though the accounts aren't sexual at all, there could be some first century Jewish sentiment that this was getting a little too close to paganism. Uh, the entire Jesus story is pretty close to paganism. That's because the first century Jewish Christians syncretized Judaism with a number of pagan concepts. Justin Martyr in his first apology sections 21 and 22 have this to say. When we say that the Logos, who is the firstborn of God, Jesus Christ our teacher, was produced without sexual union and was crucified and died and rose again and ascended to heaven, we propound nothing new or different from what you believe regarding those whom you call sons of God. In fact, if anybody objects that our God was crucified, this is in common with the sons of Zeus, as you call them, who suffered, as previously listed. Since their fatal sufferings are all narrated as not similar but different, so his unique passion should not seem to be any worse. Indeed, I will show, as I have undertaken, and as the argument proceeds, that he was better, for Jesus is thus shown to be better by his actions. You know, it's kind of hard to argue against Justin Martyr, one of the most prominent early church fathers. So the Jesus story from conception to resurrection is clearly close in line with paganism already. And the first Christians really didn't have a problem with that because Jesus was supposed to be better than the pagans. And there were some Jews that were not convinced of the Jesus story. The landscape of Jewish ideas in the first century was incredibly varied. There was no monolithic idea of Jewish ideas and expectations like Eric and a number of other apologists would like you to think. And obviously some Jews were perfectly fine with syncretizing Judaism with a number of pagan concepts. Philo of Alexandria and Paul were independently doing this very thing. And just like Justin Martyr said, they were doing this to show that Judaism was better than paganism. They had all the same ideas and concepts in their own scriptures, but it was better because they were Jewish. So you can see how this whole idea that the Jews wouldn't have accepted such a story unless it was definitely true is just ridiculous. Some Jews believed it and some Jews didn't. Sounds like every other crazy fucking faith. The miraculous births of Isaac, Samuel, or even John the Baptist all involved a human dad. The notion that Yahweh is causing conception even by overshadowing of the Holy Spirit isn't something that a Jewish audience is going to find all that attractive. Ah, technically with Isaac, Sarah was only able to conceive and give birth because of God's help. Sarah was barren and unable to conceive, but God made it possible. In the same way, God magically impregnated Mary. This was all done to emphasize God's role in the action. Sarah was barren and couldn't bear children because of that. And Mary couldn't bear children because she was a virgin. So his distinction here doesn't really make a lot of sense. Also, it kind of seems like Eric is implying that the virgin birth narrative was around since the conception of Christianity. It wasn't. The virgin birth narrative didn't make its appearance until the 80s with Matthew's gospel, who attributed the entire narrative to, you guessed it, scriptures. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. And they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Matthew 1, 22 to 23. Mark doesn't have a virgin birth, but rather focuses on the epiphany. That's when the archangel Messiah figure inhabited the body of a human man just after he was baptized in the Jordan by John the Baptist. The earliest Christians were convinced of Christianity by an adoptionist type of theology. Considering that Jewish kings were regularly anointed and adopted as the son of God, this was a fairly easy concept for them to get used to. And even prior to Mark's gospel in the 70s, there wasn't even an epiphany. Paul only ever attests to a divine being of Jesus and nothing historical. So really, the first Christians that spread the faith believed in a purely celestial Jesus that was killed by Satan and his demons and then subsequently resurrected in a celestial realm. By the time that Matthew's account was being written, 
They weren't only concerned with convincing Jews to become Christians. They were trying to appeal to a wider audience to include pagans. Having a savior that embodied similar ideas made it a lot easier for them to convert Gentiles to the faith. But ultimately, they were syncretizing these pagan ideas with Judaism, so it was ultimately all Jewish anyways. So they could still convince Jews to follow this path, but they opened up their audience to include pagans as well. That's why you also have this traversal of Jesus' genealogy that traces him directly back to David. Eric goes on to defend the prophecy of the virgin birth contained in Isaiah 7.14, which is what Matthew directly quotes in his gospel. Personally, I think a nuanced position on this verse is why. Specifically, the original author of this verse did not intend it to be a messianic prophecy. And for sure, a lot of Jews never considered it to be messianic for the longest time. Later, Jews and Jewish Christians who were in the midst of reinterpreting Old Testament scriptures scripture, came to understand this passage as messianic. And Eric does do a good job of defending the messianic prophecy of Isaiah 7.14. As I said before, it's very important to understand that the views of the Jewish people at this time were incredibly varied, and there was no monolithic set of views that all Jews strictly adhered to. Some were convinced that this passage was messianic, and others were not. I think that it's very important to understand what the original author meant, being that it wasn't messianic, but also it's very important to understand how first century Christians would have reinterpreted that passage to be about a messianic figure. Matthew undoubtedly tried to appeal to a Jewish audience with his references to Old Testament prophecy, but Isaiah 7.14 wasn't a passage he would have reached for unless the story was based on real events. He would have worked with something else if he was really trying to craft a story. Um, what else would he have worked with exactly? This just seems to be an unsubstantiated hand-waving away of the uncomfortable fact that Matthew cites scripture instead of a real historical source. Just saying that the Jews wouldn't have accepted this story unless it was true is not evidence, especially considering all of the counter evidence surrounding the fact that there was no monolithic set of views held by all Jews. Also, the two independent Jewish leaders being Philo and Paul syncretizing Judaism with paganism disproves Eric on this point as well. How can you say that the Jews wouldn't have accepted a virgin birth because it was too close to paganism? when it was the Jews that initially syncretized Judaism with pagan concepts. I don't think that you can say that because it literally makes no sense.